Yes. Do you want to push it back like five minutes or so? Yeah, that's what I'm going to. Yeah, we are live streaming. So I want to say oh, something here and perfect. then people will know that. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Hey, um, if you are in the live stream, I uh, just wanted to let you know that we are going to be running a few minutes late. We want to make sure that people uh, can get here. There's quite a few traffic in the Bay Area, as you may know. Um, so hang tight. We'll be here in probably 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you. During the live stream, I uh, just wanted to let you know that we are going to be running. <laughs> late today. We are, want to make sure that people uh, can get oh. here. Quite a few traffic in the Bay Area. Like, can see where they're going. Uh, so hang tight. We'll be here in probably 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Oh, great. Right. Yeah. All the way Everything. Yeah. Oh, you do the announcement? Yeah, I just wanted to let people know that we're going to be a few minutes late. You already so set, like, uh, started it then? Huh? Did you turn it off? No, it's, uh, it's been it's running. Okay. Yeah, it's been running since 6.30, and then we put this in intentionally just so people know that. Got it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool.
Is this like a here? Yep. Uh, I've been here three years. How old is Netflix? How is it? Uh, I like it a lot. Uh, how old is it? Like, yeah. well, I should have put that, yeah. Well, how old is Netflix? Oh, how old is Netflix, yeah? yeah. Uh, Did you get more? Yeah. Did you have secrets? Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. <laughs> That's true. That's true. That's actually true. So welcome everyone. If you want to take the front seats, I promise we are nice people. No lie. This is really. Yeah, you cannot get closer than that. That's crazy. Hey, 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 Wes always hates sitting over the vents. Breezes. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I don't know. Like, 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 all right, all right, let's get started. Hope you guys enjoyed the food and drinks, and you're sort of excited to hear what we have to talk about today. My name is Alan Pisa. I'm a software engineer here at Netflix. I used to be at HPE, uh, and I'm one of the core Gromit contributors. You can say that, I guess. Um, so uh, I'm really excited to have the event being hosted here today. It's a big time for us. Uh, we are working on Gromit for the past four years, and we never had an event of this size. We are also live 
streaming this. So hello, people around the world. Yes. <laughs> um, so if you have any questions, we're going to be doing a roundtable session at the end. So make sure you tweet about it and you tag at gramet.io. I have Mike, he's curating the list, and mm -hmm. I will be the moderator, and we'll be asking questions to the panel, meaning you can ask questions to anyone that is talking today. So about that, and I guess I think I should do like this. We're going to be uh, having three Gromit Core folks talking. Uh, Brian, Chris, and Eric, they are part of the Gromit team. They work at HPE. Um, we're going to have Norbert from Storybook and Ives, Ives, probably right, uh, from Code Sandbox. Uh, he's going to be talking about some cool new features that he's adding to the tools and Storybook the same. There are some new versions coming, so you're going to get a first look at what is up next for those two tools that we leverage a lot in Grub. So again, just to point it out, Please ask questions. It's going to look really weird if we are sitting in a round table <laughs> discussion with, without anything to talk about. So with that, I would like to invite Brian Jacob. He's the bigger cheese. <laughs> and that's how I should say it. No, actually, he is the VP of design at um, HPE. We actually used to have a bigger cheese, right, Brian? He's yeah. here today, yes, Martin, yeah. so thanks for being with us. Um, so please join me welcoming Brian Jacob. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for being here. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be with us. Um, as Alan said, my name is Brian Jacob. I work in our Fort Collins, Colorado office uh, for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I'm one of the co-founders of Gromit. And I also have the privilege of leading the design organization at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. So let's go ahead and, and get started. And what I want to do is start out by talking to you a little bit about why Gromit even exists. You know, some of you have been exposed to Gromit. We're here celebrating the Gromit V2 launch. Um, but I want to take a step back and just go through a little bit about why Gromit exists in the first place. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we came upon why Gromit V2. And then you'll hear some more details from some of my colleagues. So. All right, so it really started with a question. And this is a question that was from Meg Whitman, who was our CEO at the time. And it's really a pretty simple question, right? Why do all of our applications look different, even though we're a big company, we all have the same logo and all that kind of stuff? And I would imagine each of you, if you have a company of more than one person, or you have a couple of applications, then this is the same kind of question you could probably ask or have asked. Um, because this is hard, right? There's a lot of different questions. When you're designing multiple applications, how do you get them to look and feel familiar without having something to help you support that? I mean, you have to worry about things like, should our padding be four pixels or eight pixels? Or maybe you have to worry about, should our buttons have a stroke or should they be solid? Or other things about like maybe our type, what's our base font size? All these things that are super serious, right? We gotta get all this stuff right. And for those of you that aren't designers that I was kind of poking at a moment ago, uh, for those that might be developers, I'm not even going to get into the conversation of whether we should use React or Angular, right? I mean, these are the things that we're, we're up against when we're trying to solve some of these problems. <clears throat> so when faced with this question, we came up and said, okay, well, we need to find or, or either find or build a platform that's going to help us be successful in delivering these experiences so our users don't think all their applications <clears throat> are coming from different companies. So we had this challenge set out before us, and we decided we'd put together a small team, and we were going to take on this challenge, a pretty monumental task of getting to the top of this, uh, this summit here. And we were going to take on and figure out how we could help bring these applications together. Now keep in mind, at this time, Hewlett Packard was a company of 330,000 employees, operations all around the world. We were doing everything from printers to computers to superdome computers or supercomputers uh, and everything in between. And so this was a pretty big challenge that we were <coughs> undertaking. And we decided we would, um, we would go about this. This all started in the middle of 2014. <clears throat> Less than a year later, 
we had um, built the actual launch and I actually took this photo. <laughs> Martin Fink is with us. Uh, he was the one, he was our chief technology officer at the time at our Discover event, which is a big trade show we do in, in Las Vegas every year. And that's when we announced to the world that we were gonna do Grauman and we were gonna do it as an open source project, which for Hewlett Packard, we had uh, uh, frameworks like this that we had done internally before, <laughs> but we'd never done them as open source. And so this was a little bit of a new territory we were exploring is are we gonna do this thing? We're gonna use it for our own applications, but let's do it at open source and drive better adoption throughout the company, as, as well as deliver this to the community to help our uh, users be successful with that. So we did this big launch, I got a lot of excitement uh, with, our, with our internally as having this, as well as started to getting some interest from the community. And what we set out to do with this is we asked ourselves, first of all, do we even need to build our own library, right? Do we need to build something or is there one already out there that exists? I mean, all of you know that are in this room, you're in this room, you know there's plenty of JavaScript frameworks out there. So it wasn't as though there wasn't one there. But the thing that we struggled to find was a platform that let us um, cater to both the needs of the designers as well as the developer and enable that collaboration and that back and forth between those two particular roles. And we wanted to make this focused on the user because ultimately if we don't focus on the user then any of the design or development work we do doesn't really matter. So we started out, we did two primary things. We had this style guide for designers that helped them be successful. It had all the common components and widgets and we built that out and got it to be pretty comprehensive. And then we also had this developer's UI platform. And when we were trying to find something out there in the industry, it didn't exist. And that's why we undertook this initiative to go build something. There are also these five principles that we held pretty core to what we were doing initially. And these are actually principles that we still, uh, are, we still hold dear. And that is, first of all, our applications need to be simple. And coming from where we were, a lot of our applications were in the enterprise. And in the enterprise, a lot of the users there tend to be very uh, highly trained and skilled in what they're doing. And so a lot of the applications, if it wasn't intuitive, you know, when I open up my TV, we're here at Netflix, when I open my Netflix, I can figure out how to navigate that pretty easily, right? I know it takes a lot of work to make that happen, but as a consumer, that's a pretty simple thing and you guys have done a great job. Those of you that are at Netflix, making that possible. But on the enterprise side, it wasn't the case. They're often trained, they often have like if you ask for their business card, it'll say that they are trained and certified in a lot of these areas. And so they're highly skilled. And so some of these things weren't necessarily sought after as being important to be simple. But in fact, we wanted to change that. We needed to change that and make things where it was simple and approachable. We also wanted to make it beautiful. We look at a lot of enterprise applications. This is not something they tend to, to focus on but it also transcends into, into consumer applications. And actually there's psychological research that shows that applications that look good are more pleasing for the user and they can be more successful. They make fewer errors and they're more successful these applications. So it's not just an aesthetic thing, it also helps our users. It needs to be intuitive. Uh, you know, using patterns that our users are familiar with from other contexts and allow them to be able to be successful with it was another important uh, characteristic that we were uh, looking for. And then accessibility, you know, we, we have a lot of different users and even and every one of them, even if they have disabilities, whether it be something with vision or something with their uh, mobility in their hands, dexterity, all of those are important traits and that's something we still have prided, we originally prided ourselves on and we still do is making it a platform that is accessible right from the ground up being built in. And then finally responsive. All of them today, especially in the enterprise, people are not sitting behind their desks most of the time uh, or, or all of the time anyway. They're using their mobile phones, they're on tablets, they're at their children's soccer games, they're doing different things. And so expecting them to be behind a, be behind a desk on a full-size keyboard and monitor is not a reality that we could afford to assume. So these were the traits that we were really looking at when we were trying to find a platform. And the, the lack of finding one that met all of those needs and all those characteristics is what drove us to originally going after the Gromit initial uh, release that we provided. Okay, and actually, things were going okay. We were building up the community, we were getting adoption, the downloads were increasing, the stats, you were watching all that, things were going well. We were getting accolades like this. This was an unsolicited email that we got from uh, this particular uh, member of the community. It was outside in any of our companies talking about how nice it looked, how easy it was, they were successful, they tried five other frameworks and one is successful. So things were going well. We were really pleased with the initial way things were going. Internally, we're also doing great, you know, high fives all around, everyone's happy, we're having fun. 
And all that is going fantastic. And in fact, if you looked at what was going on in the community in Slack, where you probably have seen a lot of us around, if you haven't been there, we were getting good remarks there too. We were helping people out, things were going well, and everything was good. But then we started getting some questions from the community as people got in deeper and started looking at how they could build their applications as they built, started simple ones. That was all good as they got more complex and needed more capability out of it. Then we started to find places that we needed to, you know, it was tough. We, we weren't ready. We weren't as prepared for all these different scenarios as we thought we might have been. So as an example, um, one of our users, this was actually uh, one of our users from a company that split out from HP called Microfocus. They had a new brand. And this seems kind of simple and maybe trivial, but in the select component, you have a little drop down arrow where their brand, their brand said that that should not be hollow. It should be filled in. Well, we didn't have a way to do that. Our components weren't extensible to that level. Um, and so this was something we said, well, you're just going to have to fork it, create your own, and then you maintain it from here on out. It works, but that's not really the desired place that we want to end up. We also got a story of um, this card. This was a component that we created pretty early on. And it lets you put in some information. It displays nice. You kind of get this, like, if you get a bunch of them, you get, like, a Pinterest-style board. It looks kind of cool, all nice and fun. But what we found was, in fact, if you wanted one that looked a little bit different, like if you wanted to show maybe like a restaurant review, or if you wanted to show like a piece of jewelry for a fashion site, or you wanted to do something with a server, well, each one of those, it just didn't work. Unless you could fit it into this mold, it didn't work. And so some of these components that we had, we found, were too opinionated. They didn't allow for users to, to customize them and use them as they wanted. It was very much an opinionated um, way to, way to put these elements together. And then the last one here that I'll go through is another one that seems pretty simple, but we couldn't do it natively. <clears throat> and that was, okay, you've got a little notification bell icon, and then you want to put the number of things over it. You probably have seen this you know, a dozen times over on different applications. We didn't have an easy way to support this um, by, by being able to compose elements together. And so through all this, we realized what we had was being successful, <coughs> but if we wanted to get to the next level, we had to take on another challenge. We had to change some things, and some things had to change in a pretty fundamental way. And so that's where we came to the need to say, okay, we've got to take on the next mountain now. Now we've got one more we need to go for, and that's where V2. So about a year ago, we decided we were going to take on this challenge of, of really looking at how we're doing things, building on the successes we had, but changing the things that needed to be changed. And that's where this second part of it comes up. So what I want to do now is turn it over to my colleague, Chris Carlozzi, who's going to tell you a little bit more about how the design side of Gromit works. So we'll go into that. So please welcome Chris. To the stage. Hey, Brian. You guys hear me all right? Yep. Oh, I'm like loud. All right. Hello. <coughs> so, that's, my hat's pink now. It wasn't <laughs> I match, and everybody else as well. So, I'm Chris Carlozzi, uh, head of design at HPE, also one of the founders of Gromit. I'm going to try to keep myself restricted behind here, because I like to move around, I like to make a lot of noise, and I'm kind of erratic, so bear with me. So, if I get peaky, just be like, you know, tell me to be a little quiet. But, thanks for the trip down memory lane, Brian. Um, like I said, like Brian said, a lot of good, um, a lot of good learnings from V1, right? So, but what I want to talk about is V2. V2 is, for me, V1 was a great appetizer, but it was like it had no spice. Like it was like if anybody knows Nacho Libre, his whole thing was like, where are the spices? Like where did, how does it taste good? Like where is all the meat? And so when we started V2, well, that was what we started asking ourselves. We started looking at it, and we, like Ken Brian touched on, we had all these kind of input from the community and from the company about what we want to do to make it, you know, a little bit more, you know, flexible, a little bit more interesting. But at the same time, like, really come back and say, like, how can we make people build tools that w as cool as we think we can build them? And so that was what we did with V2. So I also want to kind of, as we kind of look at V2, I want to also, like, talk from a designer view. Every designer is very different. Um, I'm on Gromit. You know, 100, like not 100 percent, but I'm head of HP Design. I got some things that keep me busy otherwise. But you know, to me, some of these things that are important 
um, in working with Gromit and kind of understanding V2 are that it kind of gives me a lot of like these, what I like to call guardrails, but essentially it's, it's, it gives me essentially a basis or a kind of a, some flexibility um, within the components to kind of try some things, but also not get myself in trouble. So I've neglect, I kind of neglect over the years of working in Gromit that I'd have these things available to me. So I think of like everything is like I have so much power, you know? And, and so like the whole library, the whole set of the library of components from Gromit for me are like my playground, but they're not in my way. So it's like, like I said, like with a little bit of knowledge on the web and, and my own design knowledge, you know, whoops. Um, you know, I've got all these things available. And I want to kind of put it up here. Like, and I'm, I'm not going to walk in front. It's so bright. Um, but you can see, like, these are the things that, as a designer, were super awesome to me. Like, stack. Like, being able to compose components in a way to get, like, super unique experience or super unique uh, interactions. You know, um, taking concepts like modular scale and applying it to essentially all the UI components. Like, so, like, having base size units and type size units. And, you can kind of scale the entire UI responsively and do it in a way so that it's, it's not a breaking thing. Like, it's not just like an adaptive design. Um, and then all this other stuff, I'm going to leave it off. I'm just going to leave it there. Because some of these things we had in V1, but it wasn't consistent. And so this is what I, this is from Storybook. This is our current kind of like kitchen sink. But look what's <coughs> happening up in the top right. Like, this is pretty freaking cool. Like, for me at least as a designer. Like, you can scale type. When we, when we worked on this, we were like, we're going to break some stuff, but we're going to make it work amazing. And essentially, like, don't just look at the type. This isn't like a Zoom, like hitting Apple Plus or, you know, or Command Plus. Pardon me, old Apple guy. Um, hitting Command Plus on the keyboard, you're changing the base sizing units, and it's all doing it in a consistent manner. So you watch the weight of those charts is changing. The size, the type, the pads, everything is doing it gracefully. This is freaking cool. It's really cool. Um, so that's what I was like, ah, Tim and Eric for the win, right? Uh, I can do anything, so like all the power in the world. Um, so, but yeah, but let's stop, like, because that's like what some of the devs I worked with, like Eric, Alan, and others worked on from the community. And so, you know, um, where do I fit in, right? And so what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit of the tools. So we did V2. It was a big opportunity from V1 to kind of look at it as, what can I do better to help designers? You know, the biggest thing we run into is like, there's that handoff problem, right, in every company. Um, and so the design kit is a little, sorry, this is what happens, I move erratically. The design <laughs> kit, the design kit here, um, what it does is it gives you essentially an agnostic, of, like a set of tools that you can use, Sketch, XD, Figma, um, even, um, uh, what did I leave out, Framer X, duh. Um, the new hotness, uh, and then be able to kind of come in here, choose your, you know, your weapon of choice, and then kind of build it out. And you'll see some other things as we go into it. This kind of gives you a little bit more hand-holding. In V1, we didn't have this. We did a sticker sheet just like everybody else. It looked worse than this. It had a lot more crap in it. In V2, we kind of pulled it back to the to kind of what I call them kind of more primitives in my head, but like those smaller components, like when you kind of think in more that atom, if you're thinking more in the atomic design per perspectives, like it's kind of just gives you that base work so that you can then go build everything. And with like tools like Stack and with some of the more customization that I'll get into later, you can do a lot of cool things with these. And this, oh, I'll shut up. So I'll go next. <laughs> so some of the things that we did we, in V2, with our, when we started out with V1, I think the first commit of the icons was like 25 icons. Since V1 days, we're at like 550. So even that plus is like, it's a big plus, and it's growing. And we've got requests coming in all the time. It's becoming a library onto itself. It has its own URL where you can go and grab it and use it even just as like pure SVG, you know, kind of path art that you can manipulate with whatever framework you want, you know, any React app. It's kind of built so that it's, you know, there to share. So it's, and there's nothing holding it back from kind of playing with it or adding more. Um, so it's a, that's a big asset to me when I design. And for some reason, it wanted to show me twice. Um, so the library, um, I want to touch on a couple of the things in that design kit before I kind of get into kind of what I do day to day with it. But as you can see here, I'm kind of tapping around. There's a couple different things that some companies are doing. Like you see it at Apple, at some of the really big companies. But you don't see it like Facebook. You don't see it at some of the other companies like, or some of the other uh, UI frameworks out there or you kind of UX frameworks, whatever your stance is. Um, <laughs> but uh, as you can see, as I'm clicking around, you kind of can see from the side here, 
all the styles are baked in. We're kind of hip to all the new sketch crap, like as it rolls in every other week. So like we've got all the new like kind of styling, um, <clears throat> styling and symbol support. It's all nested. It's all tied to the base colors and the theme. So what you saw in that storybook view, when you can change a color to your say your, your base theme, which I'll talk about in a second. Maybe I should put that first. But when you change a color, it gracefully changes across the sketch document, just as it does if you changed it on the Gromit code base. So it's pretty cool. And so one of the things you kind of see pop up here every once in a while as I'm fumbling through my nicely organized folder structure here and all my, my nicely defined symbols is you'll see um, the, the sketch library um, uh, dialog pop up. And what you'll see in there is a Gromit library. And for most products like that are kind of small team startup, open source groups, they don't really provide kind of their own, their own kind of uh, hosted version. We do. So if we make changes to this at all, you just have to update it just like you can update a plugin for uh, Sketch in general. So it's super slick. You don't have to work hard. But at the same time, you can always fork and make your own. It's all in that design kit folder to kind of do what you want. So it's pretty cool. There's more, though. In V1, we did templates, which were pages. They're like kind of like views. Like you, you kind of have a blog. You have a, you know, like a a list view or an app that does like, you know, whatever. And, and, and in, v, in V2, what we really want to do, and I think Eric will talk on this a little bit more, is we, we kind of looked at it and said, like, let's start building the community. Like, where are we going to interact? People are sending us code sandboxes. <laughs> they're, they're sending us, they, they were, you know, they're, they're, they want to contribute to Gromit. Let's get that out there. So we're doing some internally as a start, but we've already got a bunch from the community that are adding these. So, these kind of give you an idea of some of the things like we're looking at a heading pattern or, or, kind of like, or a navigation pattern, a sidebar, how we do layers, how we do you know, essentially a variety of things, how we just do basic formatting and kind of those pieces. The starters are kind of that really simple start so that you're not alone when you come into the framework. Because a lot of these frameworks are like, hey, here's material. Figure it out. You know, like, <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, it's good. But so, and something we're doing now, they're new. In V1, we had this app called Ferret. Everybody kind of loved this. It's like, for some reason, our calling card. I don't know why. It's just, we, you put an app out there, and you say you can fork it and use it and mess with it. People love it. Um, but what we want to do is, there's the, once again, the community is actually beating us to this. They're building apps. This one is one I designed that's in the design kit that you can go play with today. Um, and there's also even, this is hosted publicly. So even we have comments from the community coming in through, like, Envision and other sources, so like they can kind of give us information, and even we're starting to get it to the point where they're going to launch, you know, you know, kind of uh, log issues against it, and potentially even put design PRs. Um, so you kind of have these experiences that we're building that take you a step further from the starter app and give you a little bit more sophistication, so you can kind of build on top of that. And so same as everything else, fork, change it, but it just gives you those hints of how we would handle those things and kind of how we utilize the framework. But it's kind of it's open for interpretation. So um, that's all community. And like, there's two sides of community for me with Gromit. Um, one of them is, is kind of the, the open source, and then there's the internal source. So I look at Gromit as like the shapeshifter that supports all of this. Um, and like Brian touched on, with our work that we do internally, we have a lot of partners, we have a lot of customers, we have a lot of internal teams that have variety between them, like, or, or kind of they interpret brand differently than others, just like it probably happens at Netflix, just like it happens at every company. Everybody has their own opinion, and everybody knows, like, this is why I say this is my, my presentation as a designer, because I definitely have opinions. Um, <laughs> thanks, Alan. I heard that the loudest. Um, so I want to show, again, kind of the, simp the, the ability for Gromit to kind of flex. So whenever I start a project, I kind of think in a design <laughs> system standard <laughs> mindset. So as we're building out a theme, there's, there's kind of considerations I make for each group that I work with. And I do it well, like if it's internal, I'm considered a brand, I'm considered the marketing teams and working with those groups. But even with open source, somebody has a brand they want to work with. So kind of when we build it out, we like to think of that as a design system. And Gromit is very tuned to kind of help design that very easily through the theming. And so I kind of look at this as macro, like, right? Like this is like the chameleon, like you can be anything. The other side of it with V2 that's super important that I think is fantastic is kind of this tailoring, like, you know, Autobots transform, I don't, eh, 80s kid. Uh, the, when you can come in and actually look at these pieces, like a select box, 
We can tailor those. In V1, like Brian touched on, it is super hard to do that. Now it is not. Like, this gives you a variety of, sorry it shifts there, but we can change the, context, the color context, the theme, what's inside it. If you want to search, if you want to style how the selection looks, how disabled things look. If you want to put check boxes in, you want to do multi-select, you don't want to do multi-select. You know, you want to make it really big, you want to make it really small, you can do all of it. And so that's kind of the power. And this, all this is in Storybook and, and Code Sandbox, and there's examples on our site. Documentation's fantastic to kind of give you a start <coughs> to you know how to flex it. So, um, like I said, um, these things kind of funnel into my daily life as a designer. Um, so how do I apply it, you know? Um, and so I just kind of want to touch on some, some pieces. It's very high level. I don't want to do a pitch about HP by any means. But I do want to touch on that. It, it's, it's something that builds me up. It gives me the support I need. It helps create that common language with devs. It also allows me to essentially form a conversation with the company. So the more teams that use Gromit, or even if they don't like it or they understand it, it really creates this dialogue that works really well. Like all the developers that even kind of give Gromit a little bit of time, like they get the concepts. Like it's so much easier to communicate as a designer. So, and that's, like I said, I don't need to know much. I use the documentation, I can see the storybooks, I can see the code sandbox, and I can just kind of really understand it. It, it reads really well, and I think Eric will show a little bit of that code of how easy it is that even a layman like me um, can put something like this together. So I want to get going to show you this, the, I call it sizzle reel, but it's not really. It's, uh, it's just a bunch of stuff. I would say in the last, it's like a year and a half, um, maybe, year. And this is just ones I can show. Um, but these are some of the projects. So you can kind of see the variety of things we do. We have partners like Aruba. We have um, internal projects like OneSphere. We have doc sites. We have dashboards. We have heavy data analytic views. We have, um, you know, kind of open source companies we work with. We do marketing pages. We do, like, a level even above marketing pages, which are called, like, a puff site, like, where it's, like, purely, like, you know, mood and message. It's, like, a whole, like, microsite type thing. So, any, you know, kind of all of it is on the table. This is all done in Gromit. So, um, this is... Anybody know what this is? I think guys are Netflix. Some people are Netflix probably know House Moving mm -hmm. Castle. Home. Moving home. Um, but Gromit is home. Um, like I said, these, the, in all my time at Gromit, the thing that makes me most happy about it is the community. I mean, and, and how we've kind of taken time to invest into it. Everybody cares. Like, you'll know it in the Slack forum. Like, when you go into Slack, when you read PRs, people are passionate about it. I love that about this team. I mean, it's like, for me, I know it's like, there's stars, there's KPIs that we need to be worried about. But honestly, it's all about, for me, like, I get to come to work and play with my friends or my family at a certain point. It's getting long, so it's, it's getting to be family. So this is how I see me. That's all I got. Um, uh, thanks for listening. Um, like I said, I'm Buzz Lightyear, and I kind of look at Eric as the concerned developer. Um, <laughs> and so, like I said, I'm high on my own supply, maybe, but uh, it's been a pleasure, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. I'm to correct anything that Chris said. Um, I, I should switch. Yeah. Uh, this is an avatar for uh, folks. So if you know you've really gotten into the Gromit community, if Chris has done an avatar for you, <laughs> there's folks who have had long wait lists trying to get avatars. <laughs> Chris sort of plays that as a little you know, capital that he can work with. Uh, do this, I might work on your avatar. <laughs> I, for me, uh, so I've been working with these guys for the last four years on Gromit. Um, I've been in the industry for the thing I've enjoyed most is the community, like Chris said. And I really appreciated just talking with people out there, the folks who have been involved for a long time, you know, sort of old friends of Gromit who are still in it, people who are just discovering it. And just that, that breadth of engagement and kind of the life and community, right? It feels like a community. So I, I really appreciate that about Gromit. And so thanks, you guys, all for coming here. Um, I'm just going to review some of the things that have uh, stuck around from version one that have maintained consistency. And a lot of, I'll fly through some things pretty quick because the, the stuff I want to talk about, these guys have also touched on pretty well. So some principles that we've stuck with. Um, we want Gromit to have semantic components. So we're driven more by semantics than by style. 
So our components tend to, and our, the way we build things out with it is tries to be, so if you read the code, it reads semantically. We're not throwing in extra <coughs> components. I, I say that this is a grommet principle. I would say that it is not widely practiced by lots of teams that use grommet. We'll get, uh, people will send us samples of things they're working on for some feedback and you know, it, further advice and consultant and help. And, You'd be amazed at sometimes how many boxes have been nested together to do something. And <laughs> I think sometimes that's the way people approach it. They'll throw a box and they go, well, that's not quite how I want it, so I'm just going to add. The solution is always to add another box. <laughs> <laughs> then you look at it and you realize, you know, about 90% of those boxes you don't need. And, uh, it takes a little while to bake and grommet. But I think remembering this and, and starting from this is good. Um, uh, the other big principle for us that we get a lot of questions related to is we try not to have grommet be everything <coughs> for everybody. It's trying to do the 80% of what most people do most of the time. So grommet is, is extensible. So <coughs> yeah, if you need it to do this other little thing, there's a way you can do it. But we don't all, if people ask for something, our response sometimes is, well, that might not be generic enough that we want to add it in. So the 80 the majority of what gets used is we still focus on that. So those two elements. And then lastly, and I'm going to switch this and elaborate on Chris's comment. <laughs> so I'm going to flip it around, and now I'm Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> the reason I'm Buzz Lightyear is because often you get a designer will hand you something, and you'll look at it, and you'll go, my goodness, that's going to take me like two weeks of hacking in CSS to try and get close, and even then I'm not going to hit it. And then the designer, of course, didn't think about all the responsive cases and the error cases and the message sizes and whatnot. And so what's nice about Gromit is Chris will come up with something. Whatever designer does something, Gromit gives them enough of a context to kind of constrain that chaos. And then when he'll show me something, or any developer, our guidance is really don't try and make it visually 100% like what was there. Just take the simplest semantic Gromit description of it and do that and see what it looks like. And then you come back and you talk to the designer and you say, well, you know, if we just use Gromit at its essence, this is what it gets. And you're asking for this, that, and that. And then it's just a vehicle for conversation. And I'm not saying like the developer's always right, and I'm not saying the designer's always right. But what's nice about Gromit is it gives you a framework to have sort of a neutral uh, engagement across. So sometimes I'm explaining to Chris, well, you know, Gromit works this way, and if you did it like this, it's just this sort of, oh, but my design, you know, what I really want it. So it, it works both ways in a healthy way. That's kind of my point. Gromit enables that well, I think. I think I lost. There we go. All right, so what's some of the fresh newness in V2? And these guys have hit on a little bit. Um, Gromit likes t-shirt sizing of things, so we don't, you can't sort of out of the box say, I want 37 pixels to be my button height. There's a way you can do that if you really must. But um, we tend to think in t-shirt sizes, so a lot of components have small, mediums, and larges. And we actually now have extra smalls and extra larges <laughs> to kind of stretch that out more. But what we did in v V1 had those in individual components, but a V1 small meter did not fit in a V1 small box. Small across components was not consistent, which was one of those bad things that Brian mentioned. We had to make some changes that some people were upset about, understandably. In V2, it's all proportionally aligned. So two smalls <coughs> equal one medium, and you can fit in the containers and the components that use the sizing. It all works together. That little eye charting or that, <coughs> that color test thing on the right is meant to indicate kind of padding and margin sizes also being proportional. Really it's like the fifth yeah. version of this slide, and I'm still not happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go through a little bit. Finally, we get to see, actually see some code. Some people actually like seeing code. So I'll see a little, little bit of code. Hopefully not too much. So this is theming. This is a big thing, as we discussed in, uh, with version 2. Um, this, so this is a Gromit app that has only two buttons that actually <coughs> does nothing. But at least you can see it, and that keeps the code smaller. So it's a, a primary submit button and a cancel button using the base Gromit theme. But I want to change that because I don't like Gromit's choice of color for the buttons, and it's a little too round for me. So I, I can customize my own theme, and this is just extending the Gromit theme. So I get all the base Gromit themes, but I'm going to update it by setting a few extra properties on it. And these are documented as the ways you can update the theme. 
But maybe I say, you know, that still doesn't look great on this slide because those buttons are really small and this screen is really big. So what I want to do is make the button text really big. And all I'm pointing out here is that extend on the button in the theme, which says I can put whatever CSS I want there. So this illustrates that Gromit sort of out of the box has properties. If you want to theme and, and work with those properties to tailor them, I can do that with the theme <coughs> things. But if I also want to just go wild and not have to do like an inline CSS on every single one of my buttons, I can extend the base button in the theme and then all buttons will use that. And that also works for our composed components. So for instance, if a, a select has a drop with a background or something, and you know, I want to change inside the select this internal component, you can extend all the way down through that layer. There's also an example I never added for Alan that he really wanted me to add, and I just didn't get to it. The extend can also be a function, so you can get the properties that you're currently looking at and return the styling you want to use for that particular context. Uh, one more quick example illustrating the component uh, Chris talked about, which is stack, which lets me take, in this case, I've got a chart that's in a stack for absolutely no reason other than the next slide, which are going to show that I want to add some horizontal rules to help interpretation of the chart, and then I'm going to add a trend line on top of that. And what stack is, it's, it's actually pretty simple. If you know CSS, it's just stacking position absolute things in, on, in a container that's relative around a single component that drives the layout. So that guiding child property says the first child, um, that chart is going to drive the layout. Those other boxes and the chart down below are just going to work, will be layered in and on top of it. And for like Brian's example of the notification icon with the little uh, badging on top of it, Stack lets you build kind of just about any layering of things you want. And a lot of those fancy things Chris showed in his designs about you know stuff being on top of each other. It, it, doesn't take much grommet at all at using stack <coughs> to build those out. Oh, yes. Unfortunately, I have to. Whoa. Build it. Is this is oh. laptop. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd it go? <coughs> Go forward. It looks like you have something in your forward history. Oh, yeah. Go forward. Brilliant. Oh, Ooh, Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> We're hiring. <laughs> ah, now we get to this part. There we go. So. Uh, just a couple other quick uh, component point references we're going to make. So this is for layer. Um, we had a layer in V1, but it wasn't nearly as flexible as the one in V2. So V1 or the V2 one, you can not only position it, but you can decide whether it's modal or not, which means, you know, can I, or actually that's the plain one. This is the modal one, which says I can scroll around behind it, or if it's not modal, I can't scroll around it. But I, you can see some of the, the, I can theme it sort of in line by saying, oh, layer, just be plain. Don't do any styling yourself. And that means the content of the layer gets to drive everything. So that's why there's a little opacity you can barely see in the projector. Um, similar things with a drop component. And again, this is a drop is a building component that lets you build other things with it. So you say what you want to anchor it against. And then you can choose how you want to align it. Again, whether you want it plain or not. And there's some even fancier types of alignment you can do. But this is just to illustrate a, a little bit of the concept of that. So this is just a taste of some of the components that are new. The yeah. other couple things that are big changes kind of procedurally in how we do stuff is we use Storybook a lot for two reasons. One, we use it to, uh, for all of our components, if we have some issue or something comes in, we go, oh, we don't have a good visual test for that because we really want to visually look at things and problems that people are having. So we'll have different, I wish we'd expanded one of these. And this is just a screenshot um, to show some different flavors of things, like all those selects that Chris showed. Those are all just different stories. And so it's, it's a way for us to do some visual regression on what we've got. But it's also a way then, since it's public, uh, to see what you can do with Gromit, get some inspiration from it at more of a component level. And then at a uh, bigger level uh, with Code Sandbox, we have, and this is, Chris mentioned the term starters as kits to kind of get you going with. Um, we've already started putting out these weekly patterns. And 
we're debating changing the name patterns to starters, hence the confusion for today is the same thing. Uh, but we use this both to pre-publish some, some best practice ideas, but then as people uh, submit questions or have comments or things they want to figure out how to do, we're often just putting together a quick code sandbox. So this is kind of the mechanism we share uh, interactive uh, things to work with people. Also, if anybody submits an issue and says, hey, this isn't working in Gromit, the first thing we usually say is, can you make a code sandbox for that? <laughs> um, and just as a, uh, a hint at how we like to do stuff, so a couple of days ago we decided, you know, why don't we just do this whole pro presentation in Gromit? We didn't get Brian's slides thrown into Gromit yet, but everything Chris and I did, this is just a Gromit site. It's on the public GitHub repository if you want to take a look at it. Tonight. Tonight. I'll get them in tonight. <laughs> We're working on that. Um, so thanks for your time and listening to this part. And I'm going to hand it off. We had two special guest speakers. Uh, Alan, are you handing off? Yes. All right. Alan's going to hand stuff. You want to be, you want to be the host now? OK, you can be the host. Be the host. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it together for us. All right, thank you. Cool. So while they change computers, um, we have uh, two libraries, as you heard, a storybook and code sandbox that we leverage a lot. And we feel it's not supposed only to be about Gromit. And we wanted to get the community and libraries that we leverage to share their latest stuff. So we have Norbert here. He's traveling all the way from Amsterdam just for this event. So this is pretty cool. So thank you very much. Um, I that didn't thank you yet, but thank you. Um, he faced a bunch of flight delays and took almost 40 hours to get here. So um, he's going to be talking about Storybook. He's the core contributor um, and co-founder, I believe. He will talk about the history and everything, but he's one of the main contributors. So please join me in welcoming Norbert. Hi, everyone. Is it on? Okay. I'm going to be talking about writing better components using Storybook. So I'm going to start out with a kind of depressing note, and that is writing apps is hard. Uh, I imagine this is not news to anyone. Uh, we've probably been all contributing to writing apps, and we've all been struggling, or at least from my experience, I've been struggling writing apps. Um, doing some consulting for the last X amount of years, I've seen quite a few companies struggling with apps. And if you're not struggling, I would like to know how that is possible. Um, from what I've been doing, and people asking me, like, hey, how long does it take to do this thing or change that thing? And they always ask me, like, what's the estimation? I'm always <coughs> off by either a day or a week, sometimes a month. Um, if you don't have this problem, please tell me how. The de facto standard solution to this problem is you should decompose your big application into smaller pieces, right? You run into the risk of creating a huge ball of distributed monolith where there's lots and lots of different components, but they kind of all need each other, and it's becoming even more complex than writing a big component. So is decomposing your big application into smaller pieces the solution? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for your time. <laughs> the flight was longer? All right. All right. So funny, side, uh, funny stuff aside. My name is Norbert Salangen. I am a full-time <coughs> open source maintainer of Storybook, um, developer advocate at Chroma, um, a father and a husband. Those last things are very important to me. Um, how I became a full-time open source maintainer is kind of a funny story. I want to tell it. I was using Storybook at a client when I was consulting. And I was building an uh, add-on for Storybook. And so that kind of got me into their code base and kind of understanding it. Uh, the person who I was working with, Marie, she told me one day, hey, I don't think I'm going to be spending any more time on this because Storybook is now unmaintained. It's abandoned by its original author. Mike. That would be super sad. One, as a developer, I liked it. And two, as a consultant, I thought it would be a huge disservice to just ignore that. So 
I had dipped my toes in the water of open source before. I figured, all right, maybe I should take the deep dive. I'll uh, post on GitHub saying I'm willing to maintain it. And then I went to bed. And the next morning, I woke up to an email saying I was, new to, I was now the new administrator. <laughs> 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 Okay, so getting into the actual meat of my presentation, I want to have this uh, hypothetical company. They're building a software as a service platform. They've outgrown the first stage, and now they're at the scale of three teams, and each team is kind of responsible for a section of the application that they're developing. As time progresses, these teams, they're making more and more requests to each other. Some part of the code base is kind of team A's responsibility, and team B kind of needs a change in there. And then team C comes along, and they kind of want a different feature that is kind of conflicting. These teams are blocking each other. They're wasting time, and time is money. And tensions can even rise between these teams who are thinking <coughs> that the other team is kind of inadequate and not doing things fast enough. But what's really happening is that the thing that team A wants team B to do, team B doesn't really need. Or another team has kind of asked them not to do it. So what can we learn from this? And how can we build our UIs to minimize this? And I think the key concepts here are <coughs> abstraction, isolation, and autonomy. Whereas autonomy is the thing that we want to reach. We want developers and teams to be responsible and for their own stuff and be in control of the stuff that they want to be in control of, whilst not having to reinvent the wheel all of the time, right? So good abstractions, they're the key to good software development. If you create abstractions where you shouldn't, you get this evil thing called complexity. And if you don't create the abstraction where you should, you get the same evil thing again, complexity. And I like to think about complexity as something that you're fighting. As a developer, you're a knight or a ninja, and you're fighting this thing. And if you're fighting it, it's kind of like a dragon. If you fail to combat this dragon effectively and kill it, you're feeding it, making technical debt. You're increasing the problem. Uh, I've seen a few times in my career where the technical debt became such a problem, we had to file for technical back bankruptcy. <laughs> and that basically means a rebuild. And that can take two years to get to the same level. That's two years that your competitors are getting ahead of you. So creating correct abstractions, I think it really comes down to understanding the problem. <coughs> and <coughs> isolation is uh, the possible result of good abstraction. And what I'm saying is, and I think the Grama team has been doing a fantastic uh, uh, effort here, is you should think about your components as the API that they expose. Isolated pieces will have some API for communication with the outside world. And it's this API in React terms that's the props that determine whether your component's going to be liked or, or hated. There's a trade-off. If your component isolates too much, think about this drop-down that was mentioned uh, way in the beginning. It was isolating this triangle icon away. And now, as a developer, you, have a cho you need to make a choice. Are you going to add a prop to your, comp to, to your drop-down to change the icon? I think when you're creating and adding props to an existing component, this is a, a red flag. It's a huge sign that something is happening. Uh, your component is all of a sudden taking on either more responsibility or you are abstracting too much or isolating too much. So when components abstract the right amount of stuff, they isolate enough, but not too much, and they have a good API to do things, then they will not have to change all that often. And when they do, 
the use cases are limited. I think this is really <coughs> key, uh, trying to limit the use cases in the different states that a component can be in. Those components will be easier to reuse because they're simple. And components that don't really change all that often, well, they're safer to use anyway by anyone. Then you get this autonomy. You can just take this really simple switcher or stack component without having to know exactly and, and have to change the stack component all of the time. So props for the Gromit team for actually making those types of components. <laughs> so encapsulate a UI pattern, no more, no less. Here's a little example that, that I have myself. It's a side-by-side -side component. Um, I've seen quite a few components around in, in companies, <coughs> and they create amazing components, but the, oftentimes what is forgotten is layout components, components that are just solely there for uh, making things side next to each other or below each other, keeping spacing consistent. Those types of things are often forgotten because they don't really have any pixels to render. In nothing, if you would render like the grid <coughs> component on its own, you're not seeing anything. This is something that, um, yeah, is a key takeaway. Oh, I was pressing the wrong button. That kind of helped. <laughs> uh, so just to demo this uh, one little component, I can go into <coughs> iPhone XL and then uh, flip the screen so you can see that this component actually does what it's doing. Uh, it do puts things side to side, but when the media query becomes too small for things to be <coughs> side to side, it flips them to top and bottom. That's kind of a pattern that happens all over UI. So really the key takeaway is embrace uh, writing components and using components beyond what are actually rendering pixels on the screen. You're going to run into the problem, though, that you're going to have so many components. And I think you're going to run into a problem either way. Either you have components that have so many props that you need to document them, or you're going to have so many components that you need to document them. <laughs> And I think one of the solutions to this problem is Storybook. Um, because of the demo gods that were not really in favor of me, it kind of spoiled the surprise. But you're already looking at Storybook. I wrote my presentation in Storybook, not because it's the best presentation framework <laughs> by any means, um, but it's kind of a nice effect. Um, so what can you do with Storybook? Well, it allows you to create these interactive or uh, <coughs> isolated UI sections and work on them, like a workbench. You take one component out and you put it in Storybook. Give it a couple of props, give it some state, and now you can see it right there. You don't have to do this manual stuff in your app. Let's say you've got some sign-up flow and the last component of the sign-up flow you're working on you make a change, well, maybe hot module reloading helps you a lot. Um, but if your product owner then comes along and wants to review what you've done, she or he needs to take all these steps to see that component. Well, Storybook just takes all of that out and says, you can see any component on a URL. There's more. Here's all the uh, titles that I've used for my presentation. Um, and I can... I just wanted to decide. I can see the source of uh, the story, but I can also uh, look at the accessibility <coughs> of this story. So here I can actually see that I've got one violation. And the violation is that this subtitle is not uh, contrasting enough. And maybe some people here actually uh, see that as a huge problem. Storybook allows you to do some cool things like 
Zoom, as Tana already demoed, it can overlay a grid so you can see whether things are aligned or not. Um, I can set dark backgrounds or light backgrounds. Um, and all of these things are add-ons, so they're kind of optional, and you can write your own add-ons. And here's a cool little add-on that uh, we've created. It's called Knobs, and it allows you to play with the data flowing into components live, and it will re-render immediately. Um, this works together with the accessibility add-on, um, which again is also an add-on. Um, and then there's something that we call Notes. Um, and it kind of allows you to write some documentation along your components. So um, it's, it's right there. You can switch to other components and look at the documentation. So add your own add-ons. Uh, one cool feature of Storybook is because it has all your components in a particular uh, set of props or states, what we can do is just run through all of your stories and snapshot them. And so you don't really have to write any of your unit tests that does too much snapshot. You can just snapshot all your stories if that's what you want. Uh, I personally am of the opinion that snapshotting is kind of change detection versus you know, unit testing. But hell, if it, if it helps you and your team, do it. Storybook has some APIs for integrators as well. So you can get, uh, you can <coughs> ask Storybook, hey, what's all the stories out there? Can I get its rendered HTML? Uh, can, it, can I get the URL of the iframe? Um, yes, Storybook actually does things in iframes. Uh, so this big white part here, that's an iframe. And this isolates media queries. It isolates CSS. And so it is a hassle for developers, but it's a godsend for if you actually want isolation. You're going to run into a problem. And that is, there's so much to review. And so the company that is allowing me to work on Storybook full time called Chroma, they've built this tool called Chromatic. And it essentially asks Storybook for all stories that are out there, renders it in a browser, and then allows anyone to come in and takes screenshots of all the stories, and allows you, the developer, designer, or product owner, to review the difference. So if there's any difference, uh, if, if there's no difference, then the GitHub chat mark will just be green. If there's a difference, it will be yellow and waiting for a review from someone who can either approve or deny the change. Um, this has been a huge help for uh, when I was consulting because we can get the product owner and designer to help us review PRs. So what does the future of Storybook bring? We're going to add new formats, including MDX support. This means the stories of and the dot .add API, it will stay. Um, I didn't personally invent it, and I'm not a huge fan. I'd rather write some things in Markdown and kind of have JSX intermixed. But we do want to support all <coughs> frameworks, right? And not all frameworks are like JSX. Uh, we want to add a view mode for people who are not really working on components, but more like reading about them, so a documentation focus. <coughs> we're adding TypeScript, so we're currently in the migration of more TypeScript in Storybook itself, the code base. So that means more typings are going to be available. And we're going to even allow you to edit the story source inside of Storybook itself and then save it to disk. So it's going to be pretty cool. And as I've kind of already demoed, um, we've got this new UI that's coming up in version 5, um, which will have lots of theming abilities. It's going to have more add-on APIs and more types of add-ons supported. And we're going to be having more frameworks to support because this is uh, pretty cool. What, what makes Storybook Storybook is we have this community of all these different frameworks, uh, people like Angular, Vue, React. 
we're all working on Storybook together because we support all these frameworks. I think it's super awesome that an add-on created by an Angular developer for Storybook can then later be used by Vue and React people. And we can see all these communities kind of bridging together and helping each other. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build this UI tool for <coughs> the developers and their team with the same people. So on that note, I want to thank these awesome people who have been really enriching my life for the last uh, two years almost, who have been working with creating Storybook, making it better. And I want to thank you, the audience, for listening. Ooh. Great. I just want to share a little bit of my story with Storybook. Um, I send contributions to open source projects all the time, and I appreciate sending contributions to Grumman. Um, and one of the questions in the template for the pull request um, is how should I, as a reviewer, test that this pull request is working or not? So we have the publicly available storybook.grumman.io that shows probably a bug in some of the stories. And what I tell you is like, oh, Here's, if you run my pull request locally and you spin up Storybook, look at the same story and you can compare that although the unit tests are passing, you as a reviewer, you can immediately validate using that Storybook story. And then I usually say, oh, my work fixes the story, blah, blah, blah. And if the story is not present, I actually add one as part of my pull request so that you can validate that the thing that I wanted to fix is actually fixed, although I, I still fail. Badly. Okay, but switching is um, next code sandbox, and uh, since I will probably not have enough time at the end to tell my story with code sandbox, I'll tell it now. Is when I first heard about code sandbox, it was like, oh, which company is running this? Then I put code sandbox on Google, and I say yes, because I really hope there is some open source thing to any project that I see, and in fact, code sandbox client, which is the UI is open source. And then I saw there was a company named Ives. And I was like, oh, OK, that's a nice company. And when I click and I see this picture, and I was like, wow, it's actually created by a one human being. And I actually pinged him on Twitter. And I said, wow, I'm impressed by this. And then we started chatting. And I invited him over. He was humble enough to come and talk to us. And I would like to welcome Ives von Hor. Uh, Yves Van Horn, how should I say? You should probably explain it to people. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Hello. Does it work? Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely visible. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Yves Van Horn. It's not a hard name for you alone. It's also a hard name in the Netherlands. So I'm used to all different kind of pronunciations. You can call me Yves. You can call me Ives. You can call me, you can even come call me Flip because my friends call me Flip. So <laughs> if you want to call me Flip, that's fine as well. Um, these days, I work full time on Code Sandbox. Um, who of you have heard of Code Sandbox except for this talk? Nice, cool. OK, I'm not going to explain what Code Sandbox is before I'm going to tell, uh, after I'm going to tell the story. So um, about three years ago, we were on vacation to a beautiful village with a beautiful name. It was called St. Ives, or St. Eves, or St. Eves, depends on the pronunciation. And I was working for a company called Catawiki. And we were converting our Ruby on Rails pages to React. We did this with a team of three people. And while I was on vacation, I got questions from my coworkers about React specifically and React in combination with a library. And I didn't have my laptop with me, classic problem. Um, so I wasn't able to answer any kind of uh, questions. What I had to do is I had to take the code from Slack, then interpret it in my own head, and then give them back the answers. And my interpreter is always wrong, so that didn't work. So that's when the idea popped into my head, like, what if we would have like a local editor, but on the web? So I didn't do anything with this idea. Um, I started going to university. Uh, I got distracted by university. <laughs> <laughs> but at some point, um, I started getting Java lectures, and I'm easily distractible. So I thought, OK, let's, uh, during these lectures, let's start tingling with the idea. So I opened Sketch, 
classic sketch. And uh, I started to play with the design of React Sandbox at the time. I was very focused on React. And it was, it's kind of like how it looks now. It's just very different. Um, you have code on the left in different panes, and you had this preview here on the right. And you had these kind of buttons. And the idea was that, a bit like Storybook, that you would have for every component, you would have this sort of knob where you can click on, and then you can see that specific component. So it was for documentationally purpose, if that would be a word. It was for documentation purposes. And I started it, implementing it later. And I was already super happy to see this, because when you were changing code on the left, you would see it instantly update on the right. It's evaluated in like a couple milliseconds, and that feel, felt magical, especially with this nice error screen, very intrusive. Um, <laughs> and the workings are quite simple. So I'm going to give a Code Sandbox bundler crash course. Um, so you have the editor and you have the preview. Those are two separate applications. The preview is in an iframe, so it's really in a separate application. What happens is when you change the code in the editor, it sends a post message with all the files to the iframe, and the iframe runs its own application, which is kind of like a webpack, but in the browser, a simplified webpack. So it gets the code, it transpiles the code from like with TypeScript or Babel, and it does this recursively, so it goes through all the require statements and does this for every file. And then it evaluates every file. So it does the exact same thing, recursively evaluates everything. And that renders something to the uh, preview window, except if you have an error. We do everything in a try-catch statement. If we get an error, we send a post message back with all the errors. Well, that's how Code Sandbox works. And to this day, almost everything still works <coughs> with Code Sandbox, and that's really interesting. We've just been enhancing the experience a bit. Um, so this was the 25th of November. I started to move to this tab system where when you create new files, you have tabs and you have this weird require system where you can require the tabs. It was interesting, but I decided to go for a sidebar later on. So you had, you could build projects and then you could put the projects in your projects. It was kind of like a poor man's NPM system. <laughs> lots, of lots of weird ideas behind this. Uh, <laughs> then I thought, wow, this might be a bit complicated, especially because it looks like a file system, but it isn't. So we started getting directories. <coughs> and that, this was already built <coughs> dev.codesandbox.io. And now we're already pretty far ahead. It was the 17th of December. And on the 29th of December, we got NPM support um, with a beautiful cat. <laughs> So this, at this moment, Code Sandbox was kind of done already. Um, Buzz joined uh, a month before, I think, and we decided, okay, let's start releasing this. So we stopped working on it. We didn't do anything with it, uh, and we released it in April, like four months later. <laughs> and now I can show you what it is. So Code Sandbox. Is this? Oh no, I go to my dashboard. That's not supposed to happen. Oof. Code Sandbox is um, an online code editor that's especially focused for front end frameworks. And it looks and works like your local editor. So if you have this, make it a bit bigger. You have code on the left, uh, you have multiple files. You can change the files, and that's the new thing. It has this preview. And it works like I explained before, where you have this kind of circular thing. But now it supports lots of different transpilers. It has many optimizations to make it faster. One of the very cool things about Code Sandboxes is that you can fork sandboxes. So whenever you make something and you want to share it with someone else, you can create this sandbox, then you can take the URL and share it with someone else, and they can fork it again. Then you have some other fancy things like uh, you can export to GitHub um, or commit <coughs> or pull requests to GitHub. You can deploy it with that site. And you can also have kind of like Google Drive way sharing with people so you can do collaborate live. So after this, Code Sandbox became more popular than we expected. It went faster than we expected. Biggest reason is that whatever's built on Code Sandbox is well, almost everything is shared by people. 
And uh, we under, underestimated this way that people, when they build something, they share it. And it was like a wildfire. And with that, because we're open source, the issues started piling on. And uh, we got lots of different feature requests, lots of different questions. And we decided to set up a system where we could say, like, um, these are also our priorities. The first one is lower the learning curve. The second one is encourage sharing and discovery. And the third one is give a local editor experience. And I'm going through the values a bit with some example features that we've recently <coughs> built that empower those values, I'd say. So the first one is lower the learning curve. And this one is very, this one has been working very well at the start. And we only saw that this was used this way after we released Code Sandbox. So we released Code Sandbox and we saw that people started to use Code Sandbox to learn web development. And it makes a lot of sense because, as you all know, web development is very fragmented with 400 choices before you work on something. For, for example, let's say someone's new and they want to start to do web development. <coughs> First thing is learn the terminal. Uh, which terminal? Should I learn Bash? Should I use NPM? What is NPM or should I use Yarn? There, is, there are many choices. And what it comes down to, they want to code. And with code sample except it is a bit easier because they can go to the website and they can start editing some code and it updates live. And that's the gist of it. So they can have this experience of editing code already before having to set up this whole environment because in the end, that's the thing that they wanted to learn. The second one is encourage sharing and discovery. This one is, sounds a bit clear because we have uh, sharing in code sandbox built in, but the discovery part is really interesting because everything that people build, well, almost everything, is automatically public. So people kind of, we have this big knowledge base of information. And at the start, we didn't do that much to show this knowledge base to people, but later on we did. So we now have this, it's, it's a bit older now. Mm. Type in here. But it's search. And we have 1.2 million sandboxes here. So this is like a gold mine of information about examples, et cetera. For example, if you want to have examples with the dependency Gromit, you can filter on it, and you can see all the sandboxes that have Gromit. Same for lots of other libraries. It's like if you want to find Redux, you get Redux. <laughs> and something recently that we released is uh, Explore page. And this is really cool because we highlight the cool sandboxes that have been built on Code Sandbox here. Uh, this one, for example, is really cool. And people can go here to find inspiration for implementations or for um, how something works. This is also really cool. This is an <coughs> animation. This is <coughs> But they have this uh, live coding thing. I don't do anything, but you can see the CSS update live. And this is one of my favorites. This is Mario Kart. But there's no JavaScript involved. And I can do this. Like, I can move. <laughs> I, can, I can even change my character. Now I'm Bowser. And this is all. <laughs> can I open it? How does this website work? <laughs> <laughs> and it's all in CSS. There is no JavaScript here involved. Every file is a CSS. <coughs> Huge CSS files, that's true. <laughs> Why? <laughs> it's cre it creates Why? a good demo. <laughs> <coughs> the last one is give a local editor experience. One of the most obvious reasons for give a local de developer experience is development. Uh, people ask, like, uh, do you want to make this a real primary code editor? And that's one of our goals for the long term. We want to build code sandbox in code sandbox, kind of. And then we can build code sandbox in that again. It's kind of like the chicken egg thing. But there are many more reasons to give a local editor experience. For example, if you <coughs> build something in code sandbox and you have your local editor, the experience should be seamless so that if you have shortcuts in Code Sandbox, they should work the same in your primary editor so you don't have this friction of switching between the two. Another reason is if people start to learn development in Code Sandbox, they shouldn't learn a new environment when they go local. Um, and I want to show something really cool that I've been really excited about um, with Code Sandbox is that we have VS Code. Um, in the browser, which sounds really strange, but it comes down to this part 
is, is uh, VS Code. So I can do things like open styles. Uh, it's, it's, it's like VS Code. I can open a grid view, and then I can move files in here. I can do this cool demo. Like, ooh. <laughs> um, and another good effect of this is you can have your VS Code settings directly in Code Sandbox. So for example, I can open settings here. Can I close this one? This is just your VS Code settings. You can copy over your VS Code settings to Code Sandbox, and it works exactly the same. Another cool thing is that this also works for key bindings. So if I go to key bindings, so I can change all the key bindings here. And this also works for your <coughs> themes. So I can set like different themes. Um, it is literally VS Code. <laughs> That's quite extreme. Um, I'm a fan of dark themes. Um, we installed some default themes, but you can also just copy over your VS Code. I can, I could, yeah. Oh, I don't know where it is. But yeah, I can copy over the theme and then uh, show it too. Um, I have two minutes, that's nice. Another thing <laughs> that, uh, that we've seen a lot of usage in is libraries. And when we were working on Code Sandbox, we didn't think of this use case. But it turns out that it's a really good use case. The first thing we saw when we released Code Sandbox is that some libraries started to build their examples in Code Sandbox. And that is already super cool. Like uh, Redux uses it for their examples. And there are sometimes, there are several websites like <coughs> reach.router. I don't know if this is it. Yeah, reach.vector/router. They have like a whole page, like a whole, and it's styled to Code Sandbox. And then there is a Code Sandbox in it too. Mm -hmm. um, the same for React Table. It's um, React Table. And this is a really good use case. And a new effect of this is that um, a new effect of this is that people started to do bug reports using the examples. So whenever someone had a problem, they got a code sandbox <laughs> example, reproduced the bug in that in that sandbox, and then they send that to the issues. And um, lots of places now recommend using code sandbox for bug reports. So that's pretty cool. And a similar thing that happens is that people ask questions by putting a library in the sandbox and they say, like, how, why, does, why doesn't this work? Uh, really interesting use cases. And we were thinking, can we make this better? Can we be more useful for libraries? So we now have this fourth thing we're working on. Um, it is a new feature. When you look at websites, they often have this thing, if someone opens a pull request, you can see the website. Um, it gets auto-deployed, and on a temporary URL, you can see the website. So whenever a maintainer sees a pull request of a website, they see immediately what changed in the website, and they can test it without downloading anything locally. Uh, Netlify and Site do this now. But nothing happened for libraries in this space. And with Code Sandbox, we now have, I, I created this beautiful flowchart. Um, when someone <laughs> creates a PR, at Code Sandbox, we built the library, so it's like an NPM publish, but we create a sandbox with that library of that PR pre-installed, and then we comment on that PR with a new sandbox that's been created with this version of the library, so that maintainers, they don't have to download the, the whole PR, they don't have to check out the whole PR and install all the dependencies, etc. And it works a bit like, it will work a bit like this, I did an example of Redux. It will create, this is the deployed version of Redux put into node modules. And when you require Redux, you see that version. And that way, <coughs> yeah, that's what I noticed when working with libraries that I always have to check out the PRs to test the APIs. And this way you can just test it directly in Code Sandbox. Okay, um, that's all I have today. Um, thanks to all the contributors because yeah, we're open source. So check out our repository. This list is already out, uh, outdated because now we have more than 100 contributors. But uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, thank you very much. Cool, thanks. thanks. Yeah. Now we're going to switch a little bit and, and we're going to do a um, round table. So I hope we have questions. questions. If I don't have questions, I have questions. <laughs> And then um, just give us a little time, and I will invite all the speakers to be here. And I'll be the moderator, which will basically ask questions. And if you have a question in the audience, you can 
ask uh, me or um, or shout out. I don't think we have. Uh, I will make sure to repeat the question because we have a bunch of people in the uh, live stream. I'll sit here. Not give this judgment. Yeah, I just want to keep looking. It's like weird, the moderator asking questions without <coughs> looking at the panel, I guess. All right. So first question, how do I get started? If I want to use Grammar today, what's your recommendation? If I am a designer or a developer, how to get started? Bachelor number one? one no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I didn't listen. I was just laughing at the format. So do I need to know React or anything? How, how should I get started if I want to use Gromit today? What, what, what's the ask from, from the team to say, okay? I, I think the place to start is to get on the Slack community, introduce yourself, yourself, and then describe a little what you're trying to do. So it depends like how much technology you know, what type of thing you're trying to build, like there's, you know, how much design you've already got. So. Maybe the question seems so broad to me that I'd want to narrow it down a little more to give something a little more helpful. Okay. If you're new to, if it's more of a technical standpoint, we usually tell people learn React first. If you don't know React at all, start there before you even consider Gromit. And then um, once you know React, then you've got some context and you can start pulling Gromit in, build something with it as rudimentary as possible, but then engage in the community and ask questions. And as a designer, if I'm a designer, do I need to learn React? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> so what do I need to learn if I want to be a designer on Gram? I mean, like, it's, like, it's, like I said in the talk, it's like the resources are there. And it's kind of like Eric said, like you can reach out in Slack and we'll help you along. I mean, I think there's a lot of tools there that kind of help you get started. So if you're, if you're familiar with any design tools like from Adobe, there's something in there for everybody to kind of get started. Um, oh, but I mean, so I don't need to know Sketch or anything. I no, you don't have to like. I mean, there's there's tools that we like. I prefer Sketch because it has like a lot of flexibility and plugins and other things we can do to kind of leverage like things we're trying to achieve to kind of get more more close to the code. And same with like Framer X, like those that those kind of tools <coughs> are more like for me a little bit more useful in getting closer to what the coded experience is, right? Like when I'm trying to learn. But from a from a design standpoint, it's kind of like if you like XD, you like Figma, you want, we can, we can, all the, the tools are in there just to play around with. But, okay. but just to give an example on that, Alan, we had a team um, probably three or four months ago that contacted me. This was inside of Hewlett Packard Enterprise that was building um, one of our next uh, server platforms, and they had an embedded management console they were building on theirs. And this particular person was a developer who had, he was a developer, but he didn't have any front end experience whatsoever. So I suggested, like Eric said, was, you know, first you should learn React. And that's, you know, like JavaScript and it is even, you know, maybe before React. Um, but it's been interesting to see him, and, and this is just one example of many, as they go through and learn and, and be able to use the resources we have, including those where we can do little interactions like on Code Sandbox. They can browse through on Storyboard and, or uh, Storybook, excuse me and see what components and controls are there. And so I think it, depending on who the user is and what their experience is with front-end development, we've had other people who are come in and they're, um, they, one of the companies we've acquired recently, are they're, they're using React. They weren't using Grama, but they were using React. So for them, it's really simple <coughs> to go in and start using it because they're familiar with it and they just get all these controls and components that they can start using. So it really depends on where they're starting from as to how they get started. And like Eric said, that's one of the things we, we and the other people in the community uh, are very good about helping them, meeting them where they are and getting them to where they can be successful. Cool. I do have more questions here. I just want to make sure I will stop for a second to see if there is any question for the audience. If you have any, you can raise your hand and find you. Any time, okay, Mike. Yeah, well, there's, um, so if someone came in and, and they were eager to get started and said, hey, I can't, I can't go learn React before I start playing with this. I just want to start playing. Does Gromit help? people learn how to use React? So let me just repeat the questions. I know you are anxious to answer. So <laughs> the question is, do I need, uh, do, if I use Gromit, am I gonna, gonna help learning React? Right, I, I changed your question a little bit. Sorry about that. <laughs> if I want to just go straight to using Gromit without ha having any 
any yeah. real experience is there a way I can kind of play and fiddle with it? And, and you, you can, can at the design level using some of the design the tools. tools. You, you can if you have a code sandbox link or you're looking at um, some of the, there's a little bit of embedded editor and visualizer sort of a super you know, poor man's code sandbox embedded in the Brahmin <laughs> documentation <laughs> that allows you to tweak and see what that does. So in other words, if you, classic is it says hello world and I change that to hello something and it shows up and I can kind of build from that. Um, sort of sort of build from the inside out learning it as opposed to learning you know the whole pipeline and, and getting down to the code at that side. So you can go from either direction. I would say the starting from editing something in line you'll you can go so far but at some point you're going to bump into needing to get a little better conceptual understanding. But I think a little bit but probably not I don't think we would have the tools to say I start from Gromit and I there's a pure grommet path of tools and capabilities we provide that get you to be a, a full-fledged developing application here. I think that bridges us to the next question that I have here. I saw a hand raising, but I'll get you in a second. Mm -hmm. um, what are the tools that you can use to improve your developer experience? So that bridges a little bit to what you're alluding, and then I want to make sure I get participation from our guests too. All right. Want me to go first? Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, like, what tools do I? Do? As a developer, <laughs> what tools would you recommend the audience to? Oh, you should use VS Code for whatever reason, or no, or you shouldn't use it. Or I think actually, the most valuable tool is Slack. <laughs> for us, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know something, you can ask there, and somebody will point you to something. <clears throat> I think that's the most helpful. Um, yeah, I use VS Code. I was using Atom for a while. I'm, I'm sort of. I, I switch my browser every three months. I switch my editor somewhat frequently also just to kind of learn and stay fresh. Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I think just because I keep trying different things. Nothing in particular stands out to me as like, oh, this is like the killer developer tool that I have to have. And if I didn't have that, I couldn't do something I needed to do. That's a good way to put it. Maybe the smorgasbord. Okay. I'm curious to hear what. what yeah, no, that's a yeah, so um, any tool that gives you feedback as a developer, that is really uh, value. Um, a few tools that I like to use are like Prettier and ESLint. They, they help me a ton write better applications, better components, because they provide you with feedback like, hey, you should probably, uh, you, you've got this scope problem or you're, 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 you should be hoisting this. and. Most of that stuff is like almost automated if you've got a modern setup with Prettier and VS Code and uh, you integrating VS Code into Code Sandbox <laughs> opens up like all those things in the browser. It's amazing. And so, yeah, for me, it's like getting feedback and TypeScript is an or if a flow typing can really help you along there as well. It, it provides like, hey, something is wrong here. This thing could be <coughs> defined. You should probably be doing something here to catch that error because it might happen. And yeah, that's, that's really helping me as a developer. Yeah. 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 Anything that can lower your feedback loop is really valuable. Um, you can kind of measure it, but uh, another thing that has really helped with uh, lowering feedback loops is unit testing. Like you make a change to the code and you see within a second how it affects your tests. That is super valuable. Uh, I'm a Code Sandbox advocate, so <laughs> it's uh, Code Sandbox. Uh, I use it for prototyping a lot. If I want to see it quickly, uh, see something, something uh, how it works, then I just paste something in Code Sandbox and I see yeah. my result. Um, yeah, anything, the most valuable tools are the tools that lower the feedback loop. Yeah, another one is, uh, for me, is Netlify. It provides a lot of value. Uh, so for us, we have a ton of examples within the storybook repo and we deploy all of those examples to Netlify <coughs> on every commit and they're online <coughs> indefinitely public. So we can look back in history like hey so this bug appeared and it was then and we can see the div and we can trace it back all the way. Uh, that, that's amazing and it's also feedback as a uh, someone who reviews a PR you want to make sure that like nothing broke and you want to be able to review it quickly without having to check out the uh, fork and 
uh, spinning up it locally. <coughs> that can take a few minutes on a large monorepo. And so having it deployed is amazing. Yeah, it, it can trigger the fast action. I've done it in Gromit a bunch of times. I, <laughs> oh, I don't want to run this locally. That's the, the, the code death and GitHub looks good to me. I'll just merge this and then boom, something fails later on. So I really <laughs> like to have feedback now that avoids me to having to do this kind of uh, mistake. It happened to you, man, really? No, it, no, no, now this doesn't happen anymore. No, not anymore. No. Not anymore. Uh, yeah, yeah, never. I did that a bunch of times. So I want to make sure that someone raised their hand for questions. Um, do you still have a question? Or I didn't see a, a hand raising. Was it Peter? Peter? Yeah, front row. Yeah, front row. Front row. Oh, Tracy. Yeah. Um, this has to do with just um, Gromit is open source. And so I was wondering, do we believe that its success came from it being open source and the adoption increased because it was open source even internally? Um, was that solely based on it being open source or do you think that we would have received the same adoption without it being open source? Okay, the question is, um, what, uh, is Gromit <laughs> open source? Is that the only a measurement of success or you would think if, even if we're just inside HP you would be as successful as we are now? So we, when, um, when we were st first starting out, actually Eric and I worked on a, a project inside of HP before Gromit, and we had a UI library with it as well, and it was not open source. And what we found, we did get some adoption with it, actually some pretty decent adoption with it, but one of the challenges was is if you had to be really persistent if you wanted to get access to the source code, because first you had to find the person, right? There wasn't, we didn't have internal GitHub Enterprise or anything like that, so you had to find where the source code lived and then find the people who were behind it and then allow for access and all that. And it's not like we weren't willing. It's just it took a lot of effort to get over that hurdle. And so it wasn't, it, we didn't get near the level of adoption by it using standard open source shared tools that, that we're getting with this. And, and the other part of it that I think has been, been really helpful is within a big company, people are apprehensive. You know, are, are you going to be here a year later? Or, or you know, what, what, what's gonna happen? I mean, things happen in different companies. You might lose interest and switch over to a different thing. And so they're kind of betting their application's future on whether you're still there. And so with it being open source, you can lower that a little bit because then um, even if you do go away, it's not like it's gone. It's still out there. They could pick it up like the story that Norbert told about, you know, I'll be the maintainer. You know, so so if, if worse came to worse, they still have that option at their disposal. And not that we want that to have to exercise that or we're going to exercise that, but it becomes something that can lower the barrier. So I think there's a big perception um, out there that by being open source, it helps even it, for us. It has been absolutely instrumental in increasing um, the adoption. It can be done without it, but um, if anyone's out there it's it, wanting to do this, making it open source definitely helps um, to grow the adoption and get people competent with it. And then the other side of it is, then you get other places like, you know, now we have people at Netflix and a bunch of other companies giving contributions that are making it better that we would have never gotten if it just stayed uh, closed source and internal. So for us it was, uh, you know, the obvious decision. In fact, I was uh, talking with Martin Fink earlier, our, our chief technology officer when we launched it, and he, he said, a, he made a comment out in, in the, in the um, reception saying, you know, making this open source was absolutely critical um, to what we were doing and, and the success we've had. So yeah, I think it's been definitely the right move. Anybody has anything? Yeah, the, the other comments I've heard from teams who are considering something was uh, the, the broader community support, getting support. You know, if you're a small team and it's not open, then it's relying on you to get help, mm -hmm. especially at like odd hours of the day or people like in India, we have a lot of folks using it and we're not up when they're working. But since it's an open community and there's more people involved, there's people, most of our help actually comes from non-core team members who are helping other people out in the, the channel. So it, it, it just reduces a lot of this delay, right? The, the, I like the comments about wanting to reduce the delay to do things. And so <laughs> open source does a lot to reduce the delay. Another thing that you get with open source is a bunch of tools like, oh, if you are open source, you can use us for, for free. For example, Travis, right? Yeah. So we can have a CI, we don't pay anything for it, and just like immediate feedback. And same with a lot of other tools that we leverage, like um, browser stack, browser stack, right? So, so that that's amazing. We can get a lot of like free stuff because you are open source.
Anybody else? No, I don't want to call out on people. Um, anybody else? Oh, a question. You yes. saw a hand back there. I think you raised your hand before. Okay. It wasn't me, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was just wondering if uh, Grama is currently implemented on any HPE management controllers right now or in the future, like ILO. Uh, the question is, is Gromit being used at product in HPE <laughs> Uh, I L O ILO, okay. and I missed the management part. But it's uh, like, can you tell like, inside HP, it's like how, how much Grumble yeah. is there? Yeah. So, yeah, it's implemented in a, in a lot of places. There's a new uh, cloud platform we, we released about a year ago called HP OneSphere, and it's entirely in Gromit. Most of it's V2. When we started it, V1 was the thing that was there, but it's mostly moved over to V2 now. Um, there's the uh, OneView Global Dashboard, which is one of the management uh, platforms. Uh, it's in Gromit as well. Um, we have platforms in the like the storage management, the three par group. If you've heard of that, uh, the three par group is using it. There's a piece. Chris showed some of the examples that one of the teams in Aruba has used it. Um, there's a bunch of the websites, like our Hewlett Packard Labs website, um, are using it, and there's other things that are in the pipeline that are that are using it. The one I mentioned, the embedded controller. Uh, it's not ILO specifically. ILO team does some things with Gromit, but it's not entirely a Gromit app. If you were to look at it, it's not entirely Gromit, but they take some of the components and use them. Um, so we've had really good success with NHP, and as we continue to build new products, Gromit is a de facto standard that we're using. Cool. So I have the last question because we are running out of time, and I want to be respectful, respectful of the events team. So I want to say thank you for all your effort. And if we can put our hands together for the events team. We didn't have to do anything. I put a request together and they managed that all. Like, so really, really thank you for that. And I want to say one thing. And, and, and thanks to Netflix as a whole. I mean, this is great. It's a great venue. Thanks for coming and hosting us. It's been fantastic. So thanks Thank to you and everyone at Netflix to, for doing that. Thanks for coming over from across the Atlantic and, <laughs> and being with us. That was fantastic. Yeah, thank, so, you. Yeah. thank you. Cool. So the last question is, if I want to add something to Gromit, um, what is the best approach to do it? So I, uh, what's the recommendation from the team? Well, so if you want to add something that's sort of a design concept, like a new component or some new patterns or something, I think the best place to start is probably the most place to start for anything. And this is my default answer for every question. And I just say something on Slack. because And that kind of illustrates Gromit wants to have a conversation, right? It's not that we're like trying to throttle or, or vet something. It's more we just want to help guide. And it's a lot easier to guide with a little bit of a conversation. Um, for the component library side, if it's a change to a component, submitting a pull request and saying, hey, here's what we think it should do, is, and especially if the pull request has a story included with it and uh, some unit tests, that's always nice. We'll t ask you to do that if you didn't do that initially. But if it's something a little more evolved, like um, you know, switching over, uh, creating a big new component or refactoring a component significantly, we suggest having a conversation with us where we can discuss, well, how are you thinking about doing it? Um, if you were to go all the way and just do a big thing and send a pull request for it, we'd probably look at it and have a lot of feedback that might take some time to change. Yeah. And that's hard on both parties, I might yeah. want to add. Um, so I, I do the exact same thing. I try to have a conversation, a sometimes FaceTime, or like a face-to-face -face conversation with new contributors for a storybook. Um, one, to get, them, to get to know them a little bit and kind of transcend the uh, uh, strangers meeting over the internet phenomenon. Like, uh, just we're both humans. We're both doing fun things. Let's have fun and help each other out. Uh, and then, of course, you want to exchange ideas about the actual product that or the thing that you're building. So you don't get into this uh, situation where someone has spent a lot of time building something that you now, as a maker, <coughs> have to say this is not fit for this a particular product. And that's, that's a really hard thing to do as a maintainer. And it's a really hard thing to receive as a contributor. And that's definitely what you want to avoid. So yes, having a discussion about what you're going to be doing, that is the way to go. It, and it's amazing that um, we are now uh, exploring adding first class support to TypeScript, given the, the ask from the community. And someone the other day just created a private channel and added Eric and I, hey, let's <coughs> talk about this. And then everyone that was interested to help with TypeScript is now joining this public ch channel. Uh, and then we will soon have a plan 
that we'll divide up the work that we have the, the Orestes in France. He's very excited to help with that. And we have a, a bunch of other people that are like wanting to contribute. So starting a, a separate channel for that, because otherwise the general channels just get busier and difficult to track things. And then one thing that I, I think it helps is once it's something big like changing to TypeScript, it's like let's move this over, start exploring this, and have a plan so that we can divide up and uh, listen to the community. So with that, I want to thank you all for being in the panel. I want to thank you for being here. I hope the session was useful for you that you learned something today. And I guess I'll see you next time. Thank you. Yeah, great to meet you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Take care. Thanks for everything. Bye. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> You're making them all back. Huh? Going back to the I'll come back for a little bit. I uh, I'm not sure I heard the other one. Um, bunker? Bunker? Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, you understand, found out about it in seven morning. one, but then I thought it'd be seven. That was my very first out. project that I ever did. Yeah. Worked. Cool. What did you, what yeah. specifically did you work on? Yeah. Super new. Uh, we were trying to remember. But already enjoyed. I remember that effort. I remember that effort. We, we, um, yeah.